Um, tonight's episode, we are going to be doing the state of education. There have been a lot of um, changes these last few weeks in our education system, really. I mean, really, in the world, everything has really just kind of done a whole Shifting. switch. And so, um, you know, we're really looking to create a conversation, right? There's, these changes are here. Um, it's happening. Um, it's probably not going away anytime soon. So, um, you know, we have people on this call here tonight. Maybe some people might be coming in and out because they might be having some technical difficulties. Um, but we will continue the conversation regardless. Um, once again, thank you guys for joining us here tonight. Um, for those of you on the call, if you can just please introduce yourselves, your name, um, your education, and education if you have a child, um, and what really your stake in this education process is. Like, what do you, what's your investment in this education process, and what do you feel like you hold? What, what's your responsibility in this? So, mm -hmm. um, Maury. To, uh, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Maury DiGlavaglia. I am a educational leader in the New York City Department of Education. I'm also a mom of two children, a 10-year-old and a six-year-old. Uh, so um, my stake in this has been, um, I'm mostly concerned around uh, leadership of uh, schools. Uh, my work currently is around the support of schools. I work with a group of superintendents to ensure that their districts have what they need on the support end. So everything from special education to English, working with uh, multilingual learners, also known as English language learners, uh, teaching and learning, HR and finance, building operations, student support services, and academic response within schools. So my stake has been 25 years in this game of making sure that children are getting the services and the leadership and the teaching that they deserve. My specialty areas are in turnaround schools. I was the principal, principal on the Lower East Side. I ran two schools, one which I turned around uh, from failure to opening up a new school in that same space. So I'm really passionate about this work. And then of course, as a parent, uh, navigating the distinctions between being an educator and a parent and how that shows up at times, which I'm really learning in this whole homeschooling process as, um, as I'm working and homeschooling my children. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, Bianca, do you mind introducing yourself? Hi everyone, so I'm Bianca. I am, I guess known mostly as a mental health advocate. I do a lot around uh, wholeness and wellness for moms, for just individuals, for everyone. Um, I'm a former uh, school counselor, um, switching over into the private practice world. And um, so I'm also a mom <laughs> and um, having to deal with my um, teenager and uh, her high school phases uh, right now. And uh, the impact is having on her and her peers I think uh, well, she said something that was very, very, very important. She said, I don't think it's that we miss um, school as much, but I think it's that we miss the structure that we've been groomed to operate in. And so she missed the, the, the living on the autopilot. Like, you know, between these hours, whether you like that building or not, this is what you go to do. And so I am here to offer support for those who are looking to break that. She has a, a routine schedule that she follows, mm -hmm. but I've been helping other moms create that as well. Great, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, Jose? Yes, hello everybody. My name is Jose Guerrero. I am a school culture assistant at Achievement First Brownsville Middle School. And so what that means is I am tasked with supporting both students, families, and teachers. And so my stake in this is these are my people. These have been my family for about five years. Um, and so I'm invested in really making sure that one, our students are set up for success because one day this will end and they have to continue this learning process, especially, especially our brown and black babies. Like they cannot afford to be set back anymore, but also wanting to support our families and our teachers who are parents 
and who are struggling right now to figure out how do I balance supporting other people's kids as well as supporting my own and families who are struggling with how do I support my students or my, my child when I don't really understand what's going on with the schooling. So it's been a lot. It's been very intense, but overall it's been very rewarding um, because again, it's kind of my duty to really support everyone involved. Thank you. Crystal. And hello, everybody. I'm sorry I was having a little struggle getting on earlier. I'm Joel, co host. So, welcome to this different structure of Iron Perspective Radio, <laughs> Iron Perspective Zoom. Uh, we really appreciate everybody logging in. Um, as Nessie said, I'm sure she said before we started, you know, we, we've been talking about looking for different ways for us to continue our conversations. And um, this is one medium. So thank you all for, for, you know, working with us as we try to figure out best ways to get some content. So thank you all. Welcome, Christella. So you just jumped in and we're going to keep it moving. Do you want to do Is that me? All right. <laughs> um, sorry, Nussie, I can't really hear you. All right. Um, my name is Christella Burnett. Um, I am a 10th grade English teacher in the state of Florida. I've been teaching for years. Um, in addition to teaching, I'm also a lamb poetry coach. So I have a group of students that I, that I coach um, poetry with. Um, and I'm also uh, part of the school leadership. So I'm also um, a lead teacher for 10th grade English. Um, I have also been blessed with babies. So I have um, an adorable three-year-old son. Um, he's a terrorist, okay? Um, <laughs> and I have a wonderful seven-year-old girl. Uh, so I'm also going through this and kind of seeing what this looks like, uh, being not just a teacher, but a lead teacher as well. So I have students who are calling on me. I have teachers who are calling on me. And then I've got my kids <laughs> who are also calling on me. So um, there's a lot, um, there's a lot at stake here. There's a lot um, to carry. So um, as far as like my stake in this, um, my concern is for my students. I teach at a Title I school and we're, we're it's the, the black and brown babies who just don't have same opportunities that you know other schools have. So um, just a matter of getting everyone what they need to make this happen has been our biggest hurdle. So yes, it's one thing for us to you know have these wonderful curriculums online and all these great things, but if the kids have no access to them, it's like all that work that went into it. What what was the point? You know. So we are still just trying to get students access you know to um internet and computer and things of that nature so i am just i lose sleep <laughs> over my kids you know and and just just making sure they have what they need to get through this Hi, that's a that's a great point because um you know i know a lot of non-teachers or maybe people who don't even have kids they've heard i'm like oh they'll just be able to work from home they'll just you know they have to change it up and they're not thinking about how many kids don't even have wi-fi they don't even have computers uh, I, I know i've heard that from teachers that i know from the elementary level all the way to high school so that's definitely something that i think the average person is not thinking about with their child uh, even the access so that's a great point thank you and you guys, are, we talked earlier, Priscilla, down in Florida, um, there are a few, what, a couple of weeks now behind New York. Yeah, That's they Florida. just got their online access today. Right, right. Oh, is Nikki jumping in? Yeah. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Nikki. Hey. Um, I'm a special hey. education teacher. Wait, there's a lot of noise going on. Are we good? Right, Nikki. Yeah, it's you. Okay. So I'm Nikki. I'm a special education teacher at a middle school in the Bronx. Um, I mostly co-teach two math classes, sixth grade and eighth grade algebra. That's my main role, but I'm also the IEP teacher at my school which means that I'm in charge of supervising the IEPs for the entire school 
and I also have to write my own IPs and, and do all that. Um, and I'm also the great team leader, which means that my sixth grade team comes to me for questions, like the teachers come to me for questions and guidance and many different things. And lastly, I'm also the teacher lead, I'm one of the teacher leaders at my school, which means that I support my principal in creating, organizing, and implementing the professional development at my school. So that being said, life at home now has been crazy because I have to maneuver all these things at home. Um, but I am grateful that we are able to continue to provide services for students. And for my students, it has been a mixed, ma big, mixed bag of strengths and challenges. For some of my kids, this remote learning stuff is great. Like I'm seeing higher engagement. I'm seeing deeper understanding. Uh, kids who have ADHD now can be home and like make noise and bang there and, and bang on the desk and sing a song and I could just mute them and they can still follow along the lesson, uh, which is awesome. But then we have students who, like you guys said, who do not have access to technology or Wi-Fi, or even if they do have access, they don't know how to use it. So I find myself calling parents and kids and like guiding them step by step on how to use these things, but it's hard to do so over the phone. You know, if I was with them like in, physically, I can show them, but it's it's been a challenge for sure. I think that at my school, I've just been lucky that my staff is so dedicated and we've had, I would say 80% to 90% of engagement on a day-to-day -day basis, which is, I don't think it's the norm for the majority of the schools. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. It's very choppy. Okay. okay, Nessie's coming up a little choppy. Can you guys hear me? Yes, okay, we can hear great. you. Great, so I'm gonna stay on. Maybe Ness will uh, jump off and uh, jump back on. Nikki, now thank you, uh, Nikki, for your answer. Just with your last answer, do you guys have access? Uh, are, are most of your students working with access? Has, has that been an issue for you? So um, when we started, I would say uh, less than 50%, maybe even like 30% of the kids had a t uh, device at home um, and knew how to use a device. But uh, we did get we did lend uh, many laptops and tablets to students who didn't have devices at home that first week, um, and there are still some of them that haven't. So in my class, there are two. There were three students who just still did not have a device when the remote learning began, but as of this week, they now have it. So it has been shipped to them by the DOE. Um, same with my eighth graders. So I would say that the majority of them have an equipment at this point. Can they use the equipment? Do they know how to use it? That that I would say. That's another question, right? I've, I've been very shocked at how quickly they got uh, laptops out, to be honest. You yes, I'm, I'm, I was surprised as well. I was very surprised. OK. Well, one of the questions that we have, I know Nasi will jump back in on us uh, when, when she gets back in. But just this was also, we wanted to have kind of a, a check-in, you know, I know Everybody on here, we're all going through this together. Nobody's been through a pandemic before. I don't think if you have, please let us know how to do this. Because um, <laughs> I think the majority of us are figuring it out. So whereas this was, we wanted to talk with educators and parents. We also wanted to use this platform as kind of just a check-in, you know, with how you are doing, how you're mental is uh, so along with that or the just genuine how are you doing what is something that you think should have been handled differently um and how it's per pertaining to education right now at least uh, as from what you're seeing from the fallout and what what should have been handled a little better um if i can shortly say this i really think that the doe was not prepared for technology in, in a larger extent, like it's 2020. And the fact that some of our students didn't know how to write an email or did never had a device or that teachers did not, did not know how to use Google Classrooms, it's, it's an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. Like we should have all been trained in this like five years ago, mm -hmm. you know? And it's something that we should be learning how to do. And I know, I know there are initiatives 
um, this year and last year on like improving tech for teachers, but it hasn't been required. It hasn't been like offered, invited in. And I feel like, you know, at 2020, it should be enforced by now. It should be enforced. Okay, yeah. excellent. Thank you, Nikki. I, would I mean, like I think to that point, Nikki's point, um, uh, that, you know, the Department of Education has not made any, has not been shy about the inequities that exist within our city. Uh, that's the, this whole, this chancellor, Chancellor Richard Carranza, he has been really for, very forthcoming and has been slammed in many ways around his equity agenda. Um, and the, 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 the gaps, the technology gaps that we've seen across the city uh, it's just another representation of that. And I think as someone, I listened to your question, Jarrell, and I was like, man, we did the best we could in terms of how we rolled it out. Um, and that's not on the defense, that's just in the real time piece of it. Right. The fact that 25,000 iPads were mailed out last week to children in shelters and the prioritization of who got them when, um, to your point, this is the first time going through this level of pandemic. You know, we've had, I, I was a principal during swine flu, We've had other things occur, but nothing on this level. And when we see schools that don't have the technology or the teachers who are not trained within it or the children who don't have it, it is the constant case that we are, a, a, we, we are the tale of two cities, right? Mm -hmm. Children on the Upper West Side have a different experience than the children in Brownsville. And my one light actually so far in this has been to watch children who would once have been disenfranchised and disconnected from that opportunity to actually mm -hmm. have iPads delivered to them, right? Because mm -hmm. their counterparts in Scarsdale don't have this challenge, yeah. right? So it, it has to start somewhere. It began with the pandemic and the urgency, um, and, I've not, and I've been in the DOE for 25 years, and believe me, I do have my criticisms of it. And there are times when I, I roll my eyes and Jose could tell you, he's been my therapist on many occasions around the department. Um, this was the first time I really saw us mobilize into action to close gaps very strategically in a way we began with shelters. We'd be, um, you know, so students in shelter and temporary housing. And then we found things out like the shelters wouldn't let them have the technology or there wasn't Wi-Fi available. So we had organizations like Spectrum and Optimum saying, we'll give you free Wi-Fi, but then those communities didn't have Spectrum. And how do you get around that? And I think the, the opportunity here, and I think this is why, this is why I agreed, Nasi, to come on, <laughs> is that I wanna be the voice that lets you know that even though we're not perfect and we have a long way to go, we do have systems in place that you can actually get access. And that's and, exciting, right? Yes. It, it, the accessibility piece is something that is unique, I think, to New York. Like, so yes, we had, I had a child the other day, a parent wrote me about, um, I got, well, not, the, not the parent, but the superintendent wrote me that the iPad was supposed to be delivered, it wasn't delivered. And we had systems in place to track the iPad. Parent got the iPad today, I found out. So yeah, we have a lot of gaps, but there are also systems in place. And if you know who to connect with, i.e. your executive director from the borough center, if you know who to connect with, then you'll be able to close those gaps. And I think that's what's unique about New York. Not that we're anywhere near perfect or have um, mm -hmm. made this in a revolutionary way. No way yeah. at all. I don't but think any, can you guys hear me now? Are you guys able to hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay, great. So I thank you, Dr. Mori. Um, I actually don't think that any educational system is perfect. Um, and certainly not the New York City one, but yeah. you know, I think there are a lot of things that are going right. So we often focus on the negative and there are certain things that are working. And so um, if you guys would just, you know, um, humor me, like what are some things besides what you just mentioned more, like this fast execution, um, putting things together in place, a lot of things, you know, a lot of this, has really happened overnight and no one was prepared for something like this, of this kind of no. caliber, right? So, um, you know, I know we heard from you, Dr. Mori, but from some of the other teachers and parents that are on this line, um, just because, you know, here at I Am Perspective, we do tend to look at 
all sides of the spectrum. We're not looking just to, you know, we don't have this agenda, like let's, you know, complain about the DOE. So that's definitely not what we're here to do tonight. Um, there might be criticism, but um, we're all here. We all have some uh, things that we have to share. So um, if you don't mind, anyone else want to jump in on this? Uh, Bianca, so, do you have? Yeah, anything? I'll add from two perspectives. I guess from the, as a parent, um, I do agree that um, they are doing the best that they can. My daughter goes to uh, P-TECH, supposed to be a technology school, and surprisingly, they found out, you know, through this, that all the kids didn't have uh, the technology that they needed, and it was an immediate turn around and like respond very quickly. And so my question as a parent was like, where were all these laptops stored out in the first place? Right. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that really I saw frustrated my daughter and her peers, and I think because they know the type of parent I am, they all have like a, a Zoom and like virtual call and they are already, uh, it, some of the kids are more equipped than their parents right? Um, and so what I've learned was the miscommunication between the teachers frustrated the kids more than what the, we are experiencing. So all of the teachers wanted the kids to be on a certain, I guess, Google Classroom or Zoom at the same time. And so it's like, wait, I don't get my credit from here. I don't know, like, what's going on? So my, my daughter actually wrote a very nice email to her teachers, like, I need you guys to communicate with one another before you guys tell us what to do. So I think that the only thing I would say or probably could have been done differently was there should be communication amongst teachers from all subject areas more often um, and it should not only be during a pandemic for us to communicate because the kids were very frustrated because they call on one another, like, what class are you in? Which, where, what are you doing? And I'm like, wait, why are the teachers not communicating with uh, one another? Uh, and so that's the only thing that I, I felt that they could been, but they got it together rapidly. They got it together, but that's something that they could have did a little bit better. And then I realized, I think on the teacher's perspective, there's no mental health support for them. Right. So a lot of teachers are also dealing with or being yeah. told that although that they are, you know, DOE teachers, they can't afford to pay for their Wi-Fi. Or, you know, one of my daughter's teachers said, my Zoom is going to cut off in 40 minutes, which means he has a free account, right? And so I was like, let's extend grace, you know, or, you know, let's check in on them because they're having to turn everything from you know, going into the building where they have access to everything to being exposed, maybe they're home, maybe they don't even live um, in a space where they can actually offer online classrooms, you know, um, or that they can have their background, you know, being seen. So they will also need someone to check in with, like, how are they doing? Um, mm -hmm. You know, who's checking in on the teachers, the educators, like I'm friends with a lot of educators on social media, so I'm checking in on them. If they're dealing with, like, you know, this is a lot for me. Um, call, they're doing 12 hour shifts now versus just, you know, I'm, I'm in, I'm doing my lesson plan. So there's pros and cons to it, but I think we need to find ways to support them versus, I don't want to say criticize because we need the critique to grow, but it's just how can we, all right, this is what we've done and how can we move on from there? So on both sides, I think that they did a good job in turning things around, but I don't want things to return. Everybody's like, I can't wait to us to go back to what it used to be. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We don't want things to go back to what it used to be. Cause are we going to pull these laptops and these access from the kids <laughs> once this is over? I hope not. We want to move forward from what we've experienced. And on one end, it's true that some kids are doing way better. Do we take, do we keep online learning for those kids? Right, and oh, we're we're definitely gonna get we're definitely gonna get there, Bianca. Yeah, so that's that's my that's yeah. My we're, yeah gonna we're gonna have there. to have a certain we're gonna have to have separate perspectives on what comes after this because <laughs> going back to there's a lot of going back to conversation. We're we're not going back to a lot of things. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go back. Um, no, but you made Bianca. You make great points. Uh, I know just listening to you before. Before the snap, that's what we'll call it. Before, <laughs> before the snap, we, uh, Nussie and I were doing Iron Perspective in schools, and we 
found ourselves seeing the kids knowing very well how the structure of the school worked. They understood that the teachers weren't talking. They understood and they craved that uh, structure. I know that was one of the first things I heard us talking about. Um, and they could tell from the hierarchy down to their teachers that it wasn't structured and they knew. Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting that you brought that up now that we're in this such a situation the kids can tell, you know. Uh, Jose, you got anything? Yeah, I think for me, I work for a charter school, so we don't work under DOE. And what I was very proud of is our response was quick, um, not only just to get tech out, but also we were feeding families. So we get our food from Red Foods and we made sure that in our agreement, we were like, hey, from the hours of 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., we need you to be giving out breakfast and lunch because we do have students that do not eat if we do not feed them as a school. So I was very proud of that. And I think the one challenge that I had, it was actually two. The first one was, I felt like it took us so long to get to remote learning. Like the DOE has been doing remote learning now for a while. We just started teaching students on Wednesday. And so for me, that was one of the frustrating points is watching my brother who goes to DOE high school, he's already doing his academic learning and my students haven't even started yet. And then along with the teachers is, we have teachers that are parents, like in my grade and seventh grade, there are three parents. And so now not only do you have to teach students, but you have to teach your babies and set them up for success. And that was very overwhelming. And I, till this day, have not heard, like, what is a solution? What can we do to support? Like, how can we alleviate some of it? And I've taken on a lot of tasks, like doing attendance and going on the Zoom calls and co-hosting and co-teaching, because I know it's difficult to be a parent in this moment trying to educate other people's kids. So overall, that was the biggest challenge. But I will say, like, the response time, I was very impressed with, like, how much we cared about our family so much that we were like, you're still going to eat. We're still going to give you food. Um, but I do wish that we would have jumped quicker into the academic portion and really consider our teachers that have kids. And I think because in charter schools, specifically in mine, there aren't many people that have kids. A lot of the teachers are young. They're like anywhere from 21 to 25, 26. And so not a lot of them have children. So I don't think that was ever a thought and it needs to become one soon. Yeah. The second mm -hmm. thing also with Bianca and Jose, you guys just mentioned um, that I think is naturally going to come from this is us talking about the welfare of our teachers, mental health welfare, as we starting to see just as we're, we're starting to do that in our medical fields. Right. We've never asked, like, what is it like to be a nurse working four shifts in a row, seeing bodies pass and doctors and everything. And now that we're overstressing that system, we're starting to ask those questions of how do we mm -hmm. get these professions mental health that they need yeah. so I think that's the next step for us looking at our teachers and like all right how do we support them as they support our children and their own children mm -hmm. yeah so Christella you're mm -hmm. both a teacher and a mother um and you are coming from a different school system as well so if you could speak a little bit about your experience on both aspects of that um, yeah, so um, where we're at in Florida, we, uh, things have been uh, just as chaotic, you know, just trying to get everything organized. I think our biggest issue when we first started, our spring break was the week of March 6th, and they really underplayed what this was. So I think that, you know, may have come from like this leadership really of the, of the state, but they just, they were like, hey, wash your hands, people who are sick and you know be fine so we went from having a spring break march 16th to march 17th hey you guys are not going back to school and that was like a day later and that's when the scrambling started so um i i sincerely i know like just as an educator myself and what i've seen other teachers do we are superhuman when it comes to having to make a thousand decisions a minute and having to be creative on the fly you know that's something that we do anyway that's something that you know we're excellent at you know when it comes to education so um i i was genuinely impressed with just the way that we've been able to take what we do in the classroom and just to translate it to something that's online and, and web-based um it is insanely like just a lot of work um one you know you have to jump the technology barrier like so all these programs that you weren't using previously now you have to learn all that so um someone mentioned that that we should have 
been trained on this from the beginning. I wholeheartedly agree. My school is a magnet school, so it's a STEAM school, and um, <laughs> we're technology focused, right? But the teachers have actually not had a lot of technology training. So um, when the time came for us to, to switch over to uh, remote learning, we spent a week, five days of daily training. And these trainings went from like, 8 a.m. to like five or six o'clock at night, you know, and we were just constantly training to catch up to what we should have had to begin with, you know. So that was a conversation I had with my supervisor. Like, had y'all done this in the beginning, like we, we requested, because they're like, oh no, there's not enough time. There was always, you know, one excuse or another. Had they done it in the beginning, we would not be in this predicament and we would have had, you know, an opportunity to roll out remote learning a lot sooner for our kids. Um, but we're here now, it's all good, you know, and started on Monday, you know, with, with remote learning. And a lot of my students are on it, which is great. Um, and then I'm running into issues with students who just won't, you know, like just, I mean, there's just been um, a myriad of different responses to this. Um, the first thing that I got Monday morning though was teachers, this is too much work. So mm -hmm. um, that's the other thing we're, we're trying to understand is, um, how this is affecting our students. So yes, you know, I think to a fault, unfortunately, that we are so um, focused on continuing education that we're discrediting the magnitude of the pandemic itself. So now I've got students who have six family members I have mm -hmm. students who have to be quarantined because their family member lives with them, you know, so they're under all of this stress and this pressure, you know, I have friends out of state, not here, but I have friends who are losing family members. And, and I'm just imagining, you know, being in a situation like that. Um, and now you also have to learn, you also have yeah. to your education. It, and that's a very, um, that's a very good point that you make, right? So knowing everything that we're currently going through i know even as an adult and i don't have any kids of my own but um i do have you know a niece and a nephew and i'm just very concerned in general but um with everything that's going on what do you guys what is what are your expectations both as educators and as parents what are your expectations with your children in terms of how much they should be um, in the classroom, right, like the virtual classroom, how long they should be learning for, um, what the structure should look like. Um, there are obviously some parents that, you know, want to keep the same, you know, eight to three or whatever the schedule is for children. Um, they want to have them get dressed up. They want them to do the whole spiel, really keep the discipline um, nature of things. Do you guys agree with this? Is this something that you're enforcing in your own homes? Do you think this should be enforced or do you think there should be some leeway? Do you think it should look differently? Maybe there are different things that they can learn right now, so. Um, I see, I think one of the most fascinating things that have happened since this started is that the, we, the way people interpret communications. Yes. So, and, and as you're talking about parents, I'm also gonna parallel that with the expectation of teachers. So I've sat in meetings where I heard that, you know, we're going to remote learning. Teachers are going to be uploading curriculum, lesson, uh, lesson plans, work for kids and parents. And then parents are now going to do this at home. And as somebody who's dancing in both worlds, one, to answer your question, no, absolutely. My house does not operate on a 815 to 245 schedule. And then I'm working from eight to whatever time I work until. It's impossible, yeah. right? So I've had teacher friends tell me that, you know, principals are doing, you know, these extreme, like they're like mirroring the exact schedule that you would have in your school at, on a remote level. And then parents feeling pressure to have their child have the exact same experience that they would have in, in school. Mm -hmm. And this is not really homeschooling in, this, in the conventional sense, because if I was homeschooling, I wouldn't be working at the DOE at the same time. Mm -hmm. And there has to be some degree of consideration. And, so, and it's always about leadership and how people interpret things, right? So when I heard that, if I was still a principal, I would have to understand that now I'm in someone's home. 
right? And if they have children, they are managing their children within a certain time construct, and then they're also managing their six hours and 20 minutes of teaching. So it's going to have to look different. And my number one word for the experience has been grace. And I've shared this with my team. I've spoken to superintendents about it. My supervisors have spoken to other people, central people about it. There has to be a degree of grace. You cannot expect it to mirror exactly, right? Because I've made jokes on Facebook about feeling like the lunch lady. And, you know, I've done every, I have a first grader and a fifth grader. So last week I was converting miles into feet and I was also doing read alouds and I was cooking lunch and I had a Zoom call. At t- I mean, come on. It's, it's, it is Im- <laughs> it's impossible to, to expect that. But I know that, that, that converting you know, feet was the hardest thing that I heard. <laughs> Let me tell you something. It was like, and now to, today we're doing tons and pounds, you know, and it is, it is, and let me say this, I'm an educator, right? So I, I have the background. I've been in the classroom. I've been a school leader. I've been a superintendent. I, I've, I have this experience and I'm just like, absolutely not. And I also think for the mental wellness of folks, um, you know, Jarrell, you mentioned earlier, we, uh, when Nussie called me about this, I had just gotten off call uh, working with a group of principals in District 18 or with uh, doing 30 minutes of mindfulness with them. Mm. So the, the mental wellness piece of our, our school family is extremely important. And we want to be able to extend that into the home as well. You know, it's, I, I, don't, I don't think it's possible to keep it as rigorous as it, as it would have been if you were going to a brick and mortar building in, in your home. And I'm not putting that kind, I want my children to do their work. They do their, do their work right before we, I came on the call to Cy was still doing his tons into pounds. All right, he was still doing it and he'll get it done. He'll get it done when he gets it done and we'll submit it when we submit it. But I, I personally, as a mom and as a human being managing life in this you know, quarantine situation, there has to be more compassion and there has to be more grace. That's just my two cents mm-hmm. on that. I, have no, a I agree you. with you 100%, Maury. And I think what I appreciated about what we did at my school as well is usually our day, daily schedule was usually 7.15 till four o'clock. Students have class now from nine to 2.40 and an extra hour of tutoring if they need it. And I think what it shows is my network continue, like we're trying to figure out how can we shorten the day and they continue to make it seem as if we couldn't. Now we see that we can. Like students have an hour in every class. It's 20 minutes of direct instruction, 40 minutes independent work while your teacher is there to support you. And we can mimic this when we go back. And so that's what I appreciated is like, we looked at the schedule and we said, okay, it's not going to make sense for right. us or for students. It's not going to be sustainable for us to say teachers you're on for the same amount of hours um and Mm -hmm. now when we do go back eventually we can sit down and have a conversation around okay clearly the schedule we had before can be maneuvered and can be fixed and let's go ahead and do that because that's been the biggest criticism from our students is these days feel so long and now we're showing them hey Mm -hmm. it's possible to shorten up the day for you as long as you you're okay with missing maybe a break here and there so yeah, that's one thing I agree. Like, it's not sustainable, and I'm glad that we're not doing that. Um, I had a question for you, Dr. Maurice. Um, you said that you were helping your son with the math and stuff. Mm-hmm. The work that you're getting for your son, is, is it like, is it a video, or is it just like, here's the assignment, figure it out how to do it yourself? It's a combination. It's a combination. And again, you know, so last week's uh, Feet and Miles had a, <laughs> had a, had a, had a video attached. Um, okay. I've also used cons. I use cons Academy, stuff like that. Gotcha. Today's pounds and ton- uh, tons and pounds did not have a video attached, but I also know that his math teacher is a mom. You right, know what I mean? Right. And I also know that if I, I, I will reach out, I am going to reach out to her tomorrow just to be like, could you just, you know, um, go over this? Cause I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not stressing. T- I, I'm personally not stressing teachers out. I, I, cause right. I, I'm, I, maybe I'm too close to it. I know too much. <laughs> Um, right. And so, and then let me say this, there's a big difference between remote learning and virtual learning. It's a different, it's a different experience. Google Classrooms provides, like what we're doing here on Zoom, you could teach a lesson on Zoom. You're not really teaching on Google Classrooms, right? You're not really teaching on Google Classrooms, right? And, it, and also yeah. the high school teachers, my heart goes out, high school and middle school, that, yeah. the rigor there, like taking yes. attendance in every class. I mean, I yes. complained about that to the higher yeah. ups. I'm like, must we, is that necessary? You know, like, <laughs> and, 
every class like the child checks in once the child got to keep on checking in throughout the day because you want to yes. make sure they're not cutting they're home. like they're, they're not like skipping we're, like going hiding on the staircase and stuff right yeah we're quarantined <laughs> they're not going anywhere so so my again, school's being a little, it, little different so we are uh-huh. actually doing live oh, what grade level are you nikki what grade six level six and are eight you? six and eight okay middle school so and in my school is a six or twelve so we have the whole school is doing this. So what we do is we have set times that was given to us by our admins that we need to go live with all of our students in Google Classroom through Google Meet or through Zoom. Um, so the kids, I can choose to show my face, I can choose not to, it's up to me. And the kids can make the same choice. Um, but I'm actually teaching, teaching. Like it, it feels like I'm teaching like a regular classroom. Like I'm showing them a PowerPoint, I'm showing them the steps. We're going through math. Like the first week we did review. So we reviewed math that they already knew. Um, because we figured, hey, we're figuring out how to use Google Classrooms. Let's just do a review for this week. Um, but this week, we started doing new content. Um, and what we're learning is it's taking longer. So, like, something that we could have mm-hmm. taught in one or two days now takes, sure. like, half the week. Um, but it's fine. At least they're learning. Like, they're learning. They feel, they, they get to see me. They get to see my co-teacher. They get to hear my voice. They get to get personalized attention and they can ask questions on the chat or via audio. Um, so it's working. And then they have an assignment like once or twice a week that they need to complete to show us that they're learning. Sometimes we give them an exit ticket right at the end of the Google Classroom uh, session. And that way we collect data right away. And then we have help sessions throughout the week. So like, oh, if you yes. didn't do so well on the exit ticket, then I will email you and say, hey, jump in on this call at this time because you needed a little extra help. So it feels like real teaching Uh, and I'm loving it. I'm enjoying doing it. And I think the kids are enjoying it too. And they are learning for the ones who are able to log in. Um, But the issue is if a child is doing that with me, just with math, and then also doing the same thing I just described with ELA, with history, with science, with technology, they're still getting their electives. With gym, yeah. they're still taking gym. I don't know how, but they're still taking gym, live session, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? And, and <laughs> yep. we have advisory, so then they also come and meet their advisor. I'm one of the advisors, and like we have check-ins and tell them their schedules and talk to them about their feelings. So then that's a lot of time online. And what I'm discovering is that they're, they're we're being required to be online like three hours a day. And then if there's multiple siblings in the house, yep. that's a lot. And if the parent is working or not working or, or is a teacher, I don't know what, you know what I mean? Like it just becomes, it compounds. So again, we're not going to take up points if a child doesn't log in online, but they're going to struggle with assignments on their own if they're not logging in online. And then what we're doing to, to counteract that is we're recording the sessions and posting it on the Google Classroom so the kids can listen to the, to the that's video. Great. But then it's like, what do we really want teachers' voices and images and students' voices and images online? Online. Right? Like, right now we're doing it because no one's telling us not to. But I, I don't feel too safe about this. Right. And this You're bringing up a whole me. different point, Nikki, that An issue. We, we didn't even think about as we were preparing for this conversation. Mm-hmm. And so we're clear that um, this is just the beginning conversation. This is not a... You know, there's no way that we're going to be able to cover every single thing during this conversation. So everything that you guys are bringing up, definitely taking notes, um, because we do want to continue having these conversations, maybe with some students next time. This is something that we're planning on doing. Um, I am perspective before, you know, before whatever, whatever you call it. What is it? Um, before the snap. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, I like that. That was something that we were looking to do snap. is facilitate conversations like this where you know parents and teachers and students can actually have um, open dialogues on what the experience is really like and where we can make um, improvements right Um, in a way where it's a safe space where you know we're not we have no clue what you guys were going to say we might have I might know some of you and I might have an idea but we don't know where it's going to go so we, we like so many people felt so close before this stop and it's like oh man we had the mayor in hand and we had the kids and we were gonna bring the parents and we was <laughs> so we we're gonna still uh we're still gonna 
we're still gonna work it out. We're still gonna get some students on here. Um, we're very grateful. We do have one last question before we wrap up, um, but I do wanna take this time to say thank you. Thank you all for your service, for your work. Even prior to this, Nussie and I being in the school system have gained a much greater appreciation for the, for the teachers mm -hmm. and for what you do. Um, we hope that when people hear this, they can hear from six different places, different portions of education um five excuse me uh what this looks like and how much work you guys are actually doing mm -hmm. um most of us are kind of like taking a break you know you, you're doing a, you're doing a ton of a lot so i salute you and thank you bianca you had your finger was that a finger raise <laughs> yeah so i was just gonna say because I've, I've i've done work as a vocational uh counselor is that there's a portion of the education system that we've kind of left out which mm -hmm. is a non-traditional school setting for those um quote unquote at risk students i like to call them untapped students mm -hmm. um so you know their perspective like those going through the gd process or mm -hmm. task whichever term we're using these days um you know trade schools all of those people that uh have been left out you know next time i think that they should also get to be involved in the conversation to see how this transition uh, is you know supporting them because I know I once worked for a program where they had DOE teachers but it was a nonprofit program so if the nonprofits workers are shut down then the DOE teachers have to be exited so just to see how they're doing because um, they have a non-traditional uh, school setting and if they're being impacted as well so I just wanted to add Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Like Nancy said, we are taking notes for all it is. This conversation, we're going to be in the house for a while. So this conversation definitely needs to happen. <laughs> Don't <laughs> say that. At no. least, at least, uh, you, you come on, y'all know. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm ready to come out. <laughs> um, Maury and I were joking earlier, like the only thing you can really do during this time, like, you got to laugh, like, you know, Mm -hmm. We got to find Absolutely. ways to laugh. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> Terrell, I know you have that last question for us. <laughs> well, um, asking, uh, yeah, and giving out our sincere gratitude uh, mm -hmm. for them and with the intentions for many people seeing this, our friends, our community. Our last question that we leave you with is, um, I guess it's kind of a two-part question. One is what improvements would you like to see with the, I know we, we've um, mentioned a lot of the things that the Department of Education is doing well and that the teachers are doing. What improvements would you like to see teacher-wise, student-wise, maybe mm -hmm. parent-wise? And how, what kind of support can you ask from the community? What, what can the friends, our friends, our families. Yeah. Uh, us, people, people like us, us, you know. Yeah, you know, because I'm not an educator, but uh, what what kind of support do you need at this yeah. time? Could I answer that last part? As, as far as community, uh, one way that everyone can impact education is call up any parent that you know, right? And and ask them how is their kid accessing their, their, their classes? Because I bet you, you know kids who have the technology but don't know how to use it. And there's no one in their immediate family that can support them through it. So if you are good, if you are an English speaker and, you're, and you know how to use a device, then the best thing you could do is call that niece or that nephew or that uh, kid from your neighbor or whoever it is and say, okay, I'm gonna walk you through the steps. You're gonna click here and you're gonna, because that's what we're, we teachers are doing, but we don't have the time for it. Right. Like we're doing it because we love our kids, but really what I need to be doing is creating the lesson plan I'm about to teach, right? Or having those conversations with the teacher so that we can plan mm -hmm. properly what time we're gonna go live, right? So that will ease up the burden on me as a teacher if, if the community was supporting their children in learning how to use email in learning how to open these apps and and commute and figure it out thank you excellent yeah. thank you i'd like to um go so i think on the the i'm going to talk from the experience of what i'm seeing works and maybe we can build on it as for the students trusting that i think they should all have um uh you know how like you go to away to college you have a residential advisor i think they should 
build student advisors in the schools because what I've noticed in my daughters and her peer group is that one person takes the leads and does like a round phone call on who is missing the assignment and they do this on their own, right? <laughs> um, so I think that there should be a student leadership kind of moving forward so that, you know, not that we want to give res full responsibility to these kids, but there are some kids who are really bored, right? Because they are probably too advanced for the work that they're being taught that can use the, this, could, this is good resume building skills, right? So they can, you know, be a student advisory to do the phone call, to check in on their peers, mm -hmm. and then to report back to the teacher. So instead of the teacher having 12 people calling her, maybe that one student. I think that's something that we can build on and continue. As for the, the educators, I think, like I mentioned before, you know, having them have check-ins as well, whether it's virtually or whatever they do, your phone, you know, conference, whether it's weekly or bi-weekly or monthly on their mental health, how they're doing moving forward. And then as a community and parents put together, I think we should have more parent hubs. You know, because right now, like when I when I do, you know, my prayer calls or whatever, I'm saying I'm really praying for the kids who have parents with mental illness. Mm -hmm. about that, and you know, maybe this is a trigger for the for them or the kids who have siblings with mental illness, and this is a trigger for them. So if they have a safe space um, and somewhere to go to talk about, like, hey, like. I'm not even like, you know, the pandemic is my everyday life, right? So we, I'm, I need support or now I have to teach or I have to support or I have to shadow, whatever I have to do. I need support on my sanity. So I'm more like on the mental health piece. Like how can we, um, I think we should have some type of parent hubs for those parents or for those individuals who have loved ones in their homes that are impacted by mental health. You know, so moving forward, something like that. So that's how I think we can do better and move forward. Like have this, I know there's PTAs, uh, but more, you know, because right now, before this happened, anxiety was already on the rise, depression was already on the rise, and all these diagnoses have been on the rise. But then now these people are stuck in quarantine with each other. Mm -hmm. A lot of medical breakdowns are happening, but there's no one, parents are like, how do I get, I'm having trouble and I have a child with autistic needs. So like, you know, all of these things, there should be a platform for them to just come and say, I don't dislike my kids, but I'm having a hard time. You know, so I think moving forward, if we already have these safe spaces created, I think that's what we in the community can do. And the school should be receptive to us. I know like the DOE and other schools want people to go through these hoops, but there are organizations that really you know, come in and they, we really want to be there to create these safe spaces. So I think the safe spaces should be virtual and in person just to provide a platform for people. That's my take. Thanks. What I'd like to see is, um, thank you, Bianca, because um, she said it was very inspiring. Um, what I'd like to see along those lines is really just greater agency and greater advocacy. What's my, I think my most frustrating thing um, as a member of the DOE is that we have it, but it's a matter of, can you access it? Can you find it? Do you know who to talk to to get it, right? Um, and closed mouths don't get fed. And in marginalized communities especially, we don't always communicate and we don't lean in, right? That we often we often wait for the outreach. So like they're giving out the iPads, oh, we'll get that. But nobody was yelling, where's my iPad, <laughs> right? Uh, like, you're not going to go remote, where's my iPad, <laughs> right? So you're, you're constantly positioned as the man who gets to fish as, the, as opposed to the man who, who's taught to fish, right? Mm -hmm. And what I would love to see on both sides of the fence, the Department of Education side, as well as on the community side, is just greater accessibility through stronger communication lines. I'm, I'm often at that table and it's a privilege to be at that table. And that's why when Nussie, Nussie, Nussie talked to me about this earlier and I was like, girl, homeschooling is a sore point right now, but I'll come on, right? Because I, I don't know who's gonna hear this, who's gonna be able to say, you know what, that Dr. Mori, I'm gonna find her and I can talk to her and you can reach out to me, right? It's very important yes. that people know who they can connect with 
so that they can get what they need to get done because it can be done. If you have a child, right, we have, we, we're, we're, uh, we're, re we're rolling out related services and special education services strong this week, right? So by next week, as we're going into it, those children are gonna be able to really start getting the remote learning that they should have been getting, right? So it, it, nobody gets left Knowing behind. your resources is definitely a very important Piece. Yeah, and, 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 and knowing yeah. who to connect with and knowing, and knowing that it's there. You don't have yeah. to be alone. In all offices, there is somebody who can advocate for you. There's somebody who can speak up on your behalf. But if you sit there in silence and you don't demand and you don't say and you don't request, you, you, you get left behind. And that's how the gap widens. So, you know, my, my one desire would just to, you know, for us as a DOE to become much more stronger in our communication lines and how we make it clear about what is actually available. And but also on the community end, advocating for what you need to see happen so that the, the gap doesn't become any wider than it already is. Excellent. Thank you for that. And Dr. Mari, I'd like to just say, right, uh, thank you for choosing to be on this, just for specifically for that, because what we do in Iron Perspective outside of this conversation, and I was talking about this earlier, I had a kindergarten teacher who was like, oh, you got a superintendent on there. You don't need me. And Absolutely, <laughs> we need that kindergarten teacher. Exactly. And I, you know, and that's yeah. what I was telling her. Like, there's, this is not a hierarchy conversation. Everybody no, it's not. matters. Everyone is a part of this. And yes, people very listen, much so. We'll get these different perspectives from you all, and we really appreciate mm -hmm. it. And you'll get to hear all these different levels of, of our educational system. So Dr. Mori, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. And talk to your superintendent. That's the person who's supposed to be able to get it <laughs> done for you. Right. <laughs> talk to your superintendent. Don't be scared of that yeah. person. Don't talk to the chancellor. Don't be scared of him. That's either. right. Talk Don't to them. To anybody. These are people. Talk yeah. to anybody who, if you see them, tap them on the shoulder. Don't be afraid to talk to anyone. There is, if we are work, we are public servants. You guys That's speak up line. if you want that help. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Jose? Yeah, I think for me, the two things right now that I'm focused on tackling is one, I'm not sure if you all are aware, but for those of us that are teaching on Zoom, there are hackers. There are people yes. who are coming into our classrooms and are spitting out disgusting things. Today, we had mm -hmm. someone like jump into mm -hmm. our Zoom classroom and was showing porn on the screen and it was like oh, wow. a lot. So trying to figure out how can we mitigate that because our students, and I'm so proud of them, they're clear that they want to learn. So that didn't impact them too much, but I don't want it to be a consistent thing. And then also making sure that the, what our network is providing in terms of the curriculum and they're providing videos for teachers, which is great, but sometimes it's not always socially conscious. Like we had an Asian woman teaching history talking about black folk and I was like, you actually need to rephrase that. Um, so making sure that the curriculum is very, you know, socially aware and appropriate for our kids. And in terms of what the community can do, I think it's important that we make sure that our families have meals and that they also have Wi-Fi. Because and even if you have Wi-Fi, what we're noticing is if you have a family of six and they all are doing remote learning at the same time, the Wi-Fi isn't fast. And so we have a lot of students who aren't getting the education because they're lagging or they're getting mm -hmm. kicked out of the room every five minutes because their sibling is on the Wi-Fi. And so there's these things called MiFi's that we can buy families, but they're back ordered. So trying to figure out how can we best support families and having like strong connection, having mm -hmm. the Wi-Fi's and also making sure that they're eating and have meals because we do have families who are in the shelters and unfortunately are not receiving adequate meals every day. Excellent, thank you. Those yes. are all great answers. Uh, Christella? Uh, yes. So one um, topic that we haven't really touched on, um, and I can really speak on this because it was something I grew up with, is um, parents in the household who do not have an education. So there are a lot of parents um, right now that are having to teach their kids um, with an eighth grade education, you know, um, or sometimes, you know, just a high school education. Um, and that's, that's a strain. It's difficult. I know, like, um, speaking on my, just on my end, um, in my house, in my household, um, it triggered abuse. You know, my father, like, had an, you know, actually an elementary school education. And um, anytime that I tried to get help, you know, or, you know, I tried to teach him something or show him something, it actually triggered, you know, you know, abuse, you know, essentially. So, um, I'm thinking about those kids who are quarantined with abusive parents right now um, that 
you know, education is not really the highest on their list um, or the students who are dealing with having to raise their younger siblings. So they're spending most of their days tutoring and, and doing the schoolwork with their kids and with their, with their kids, right? Their um, siblings. And then it's like eight, nine o'clock and that's when they're picking up on their own work. You know, so one thing that I do appreciate about my school district, there are no times. So students do not have to log on at any particular hour. Um, as long as you log on at some point in that day, you are fine and you are counted as present and accounted for. Um, so that's phenomenal. Same goes for the teachers. As long as we log on and we're on for seven and a half hours, sincerely doesn't matter what time we do so. And that flexibility has been enormous because <laughs> I get to help my daughter for the first four hours of the day. And then I get to like, you know, get started on my own work. So that's been just an epic, epic help. So um, from the community, we definitely need you all like to be around these babies. Please, please, please check in on these babies because um, like y'all are saying, a closed mouth don't get fed. Like they, they, need to, they need to know that there are people here for them and that um, they're able to get the help that they need. So um, in addition to all these wonderful courses that we're pushing out to our students, we also need to be pushing out what those mental health resources look like. Like, what are those? What is the abuse hotline? What is the suicide hotline? Things of that nature. I did have a parent on Sunday um, attempt suicide with her student like there. And she, the student called me and was like, I don't know what to do. So I'm talking to the mom to get her like that because I'm a mental health advocate as well. So, so there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot, you know, when, when it comes to the mental aspect of this, dealing with the stress of the pandemic and then the stress of having to, keep moving forward, whatever that looks like. So lots of grace. We need a lot of grace on every, on all fronts for the students. We need grace for the teachers. We need grace for, um, for our parents who are um, having to take on a task that literally they've never had to do, you know, for a lot of them, it, it was just never their responsibility. So um, this is, this is different, you know, and no one really knows how, you know, like Jarrell mentioned, like we've never gone through a pandemic you know, in, in this century, like, uh, so just trying to understand what this looks like with, with what we have is, um, it's going to require a lot of compassion, a lot of yeah. kindness, and a lot of grace. So we, yeah. we need, we need grace. Thank you. For that. That's an excellent. Uh, so next time you have to deal with a suicide caller, I spent five years on the suicide hotline, just give your girl a call. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and we'll leave that for everyone too because yeah. we'll be airing this in a few days. We're live right now. But again, we I wouldn't have known that this conversation about education would end with the suicide hotline, but that's how many things are tied into what we're dealing mm -hmm. with. That's why Nussie and I believe these conversations are important. Uh, everyone, everyone's contribution today was invaluable. You guys know way more than both Nussie and I combined on this. And uh, we, we thank you so much for checking in with us. Um, we're gonna wrap this whole thing up with the term that I've heard the most this evening, which is grace. Um, I leave you all with grace. Thank you so, like really thank yeah. you so much. I, I know there's so many people that don't know these inner workings of how much you guys are doing. A lot of us yeah. are at home and we get to tune out what the nurses are doing. We're not in the ER. We, we get to tune that out. We get to tune. If I don't, I don't have kids, so I don't have to, I hear my parent friends and I'm like, oh shit, sorry to hear that, man. So we get to kind of like <laughs> tune this out. So I'm really glad that we could bring that to, to the people. No, um, you know, we really are very grateful for all of you joining us here today. Um, this is the first time we've even tried this kind of format. So Thank you for bearing with us as we got adjusted. Uh, we, you know, we believe that these kind of conversations are vital. It's been vital before all of this happened, and we believe that it's even more important now as we are socially quarantined or as we're isolated. There's more. There has to be more opportunities for connection. Um, and if we do have some of that time, when we get to have these very important conversations, so when we discuss our what's next, when we get to those conversations we can come from a deeper understanding. Uh, my dad, um, even as an immigrant, back in the days when you had to run for school board, um, that was one of the first things that he did. So he was one of the first, he was the first South Asian elected to the school board. Um, and he did that specifically because he wanted to make sure that, that he had a role in our education. Um, 
That's the way to do it. Bringing halal food into the schools, um, helping Bengali speaking students in certain schools and all that. So education has always been very important to me. Um, I, I don't have any kids of my own either. I have a niece and a nephew. Um, and, but I do think that education is something that we all need to be involved in. This is a conversation we all have. We were all students at one point. Joel and I are both, you know, products of the public school education system here in Queens, New York. Um, and so we are having these conversations with everyone because we believe that this is, they're our, they're our future really. So um, we got to have these conversations. And so really thank you guys again for joining us tonight. Um, we do plan on having more conversations in the near future and we will definitely keep you guys in mind. And yes, thank you. Um, Coming up next, we have Speak Into Existence with May I Speak. And that's...